Uh, hi everyone, it's my first go at chairing uh, a remote uh, session and I'm a practitioner of MS Teams and Blackboard Collaborate. Zoom isn't my, isn't my natural home, uh, but, uh, but uh, we're figuring it out. So uh, it's a real honor to introduce uh, two uh, brilliant scholars and writers who I've read, whose books I've read. Uh, over the years and who both have uh, new books forthcoming, uh, which I think are really important and exciting ones. And they're go both going to be deriving some content for this evening's uh, talk, uh, topic from those new works that are about to come out. So I'll just introduce, first of all, Brian, who's going to speak first, and then we'll move on straight away afterwards to David. And uh, after that, we'll have the conversation between ourselves and then move to the, uh, Q uh, the chat room to take questions from those who've joined us. Okay, to begin with, uh, Brian Shiet is a professor of modern literature at the University of Reading and a fellow of the English Association. He's authored or edited 12 books. His recent work connects the history of anti-Semitism with colonialism and anti-Black racism. In, for example, Diasporas of the Mind, Jewish Postcolonial Writing and the Nightmare of History, published by Yale, and Ghetto, a very short introduction, published by OUP. And he's currently working on testimonies, slavery, camps, refugees for Oxford University Press. And this evening, Brian is presenting some work and ideas from his new book on the ghetto. And specifically, he's addressing tonight uh, the question, the ghetto in America, black and Jewish? Brian. Thank you. And uh, exactly, it's a question. So I thought you a brilliant intonation there, Deborah. Thank you. Um, now, I'm conscious this is uh, for Black History Month. And therefore, I think it's important that we talk about whiteness. Um, as I was thinking about, about uh, this talk, I remembered seeing uh, John Singleton's Boys in, in, the, in the Hood in Boston. And I saw it, uh, it was early 1990s, very powerful film at the time. Uh, I suspect it's been su surpassed now, but very important film at the time. And as I was leaving the cin cinema, an African-American guy turned to me and said, you're the widest guy I've ever seen. So I think we need to talk about whiteness. Um, I think we need uh, to, to think about it because there's a very odd situation when it comes to the history of the ghetto in America. Jews still to this very day, and um, we can see this in relation to many, many books on the Lower East Side, very much identify with the idea of the ghetto, with the Lower East Side as a ghetto, and with their own history of emerging through the ghetto. African-Americans, as we'll see, on the other hand, when it comes, say, to the Harlem ghetto, don't really think about it, or, or not all, let's say, think about it as a ghetto. The point that I'm making is that for Jews and other white ethnics in America, so most obviously Irish, Italian, uh, um, Hispanics, they all came through the ghetto. They all, after a generation, were largely suburbanized and could, and this is the point, leave the ghetto. In the case of African-Americans, however, for a hundred years now, it has been uh, very difficult for them to leave. They could leave after about, from about the 1920s to the 70s, they could uh, leave. And that the kind of ra the racism of the housing associations, redlining, federal law, state law, which prevented them from leaving hitherto, that did, ameliorate in the 70s, but the result was that there was white flight from the urban centers of many of the northern big cities and equally flight by the black middle classes, which from the 1920s until the 1970s were part of 
the ghetto, very unusually. So what I'm saying is we have a very strange situation where Jews and other white ethnics identify with a ghetto that never existed. It was an ethnic enclave and blacks resist or, uh, or many uh, African-Americans resist the idea that, of the, that they lived in a ghetto and the word ghetto today is very contentious. So that's the kind of wider context in which I want to go through the uh, quote sheet, which I'm hoping you can all see. Uh, the title is The Ghetto in America. And the first quote is, I think, uh, slightly covered by my visage. I apologize for that. Uh, but the first quote is from James Baldwin. All over Harlem, Negro boys and girls are growing into stunted maturity, trying desperately to find a place to stand. Now, this is James Baldwin writing an essay in 1948, so quite early on, called The Harlem Ghetto. Now, the association of black urban areas with the word ghetto actually goes back to the 1920s. It began to become more and more associated, as you can see uh, by James Baldwin's essay titled The Harlem Ghetto, by the 1940s, 1950s. By the 1960s, it was ubiquitous. And I think largely because it was a term that Martin Luther King, King especially popularized in all of his speeches, uh, the, uh, many, many of his speeches, and uh, all of the articles that you can get hold of that he wrote throughout the 60s. So the shift happened very quickly from the idea of a Jewish ghetto in America to a black or African-American ghetto in America. As early as 1948, the reason why the term was uh, even very much in the air in the 1920s is that German Jews emigrated uh, into America throughout the 19th century and brought the term ghetto with them. They absolutely hated the term ghetto. Um, it was a term that they very much wanted to put behind them. But, but in hating the term, they introduced it very much to the United States in the 19th century. And eventually it was associated with the African-American ghetto in the large northern cities from the 1920s onwards. But as I say, there was resistance to the term. And one of the most famous resistors was Ralph Ellison, who uh, replied directly to uh, James Baldwin uh, in, a, in an essay called Harlem is Nowhere. Harlem is Nowhere. This is where he lived. So it's not the Harlem ghetto, it's nowhere. He says, if Harlem is the scene of the folk Negro's death agony, It is also the setting of his transcendence, of his transcendence. So the idea of a ghetto as a, a place where you cannot escape was something that Ellison profoundly disagreed with. The idea of transcendence, the fact that of course, those living in Harlem could work in the rest of New York. Um, that, 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 uh, um, uh, that even that even if they, couldn't move out of Harlem easily. Now, Ralph Ellison wrote an incredibly important novel um, in 1952 called Invisible Man. And we're going to look at this word invisible because I think there's, a, there's an association of invisible with the ghetto and we'll see this uh, in, in some later quotes. And he takes that association without talking directly about the ghetto. So his transcendence was both social, but it was also literary and aesthetic. He didn't like the approach to the ghetto of, some, of Baldwin, also of Richard Wright, uh, who was writing on the ghetto, the Chicago ghetto from the 1940s onwards. And um, 
very much disliked, if you like, a social realist approach to the ghetto, a hard boiled approach to the ghetto. We can see this very much that the, this had an, a, an aesthetic as well as a social dimension when Ralph Ellison says the Negro ghetto meant that Negroes, quote, piss in the halls and have blood on the stairs. That was a quote from Baldwin, which denies the human complexity of Harlem. So the problem that he had with, with the idea of the ghetto is that it reduced its inhabitants. It made them less than human. And that's why he rejected the term. It's why he rejected it in social terms and it's why his novel does something completely different to, to a Baldwin or, or a Richard Wright. The fourth quote is from Baldwin and we can see how someone like James Baldwin took a completely different stance to Ellison. And for Baldwin, the idea of the ghetto was incredibly important and was something that did define black humanity, did define his own life and the life of his family. And this is a letter that he wrote to his nephew, to his nephew. And the letter is called My Dungeon Shook, My Dungeon Shook. Now, this is uh, a reference to the really important context of the 1960s, which has been repeated, sadly, uh, to this day in the United States, a summer of riots, uh, uh, severe riots in these urban areas, including arson, including shootings of all kinds, lootings of all kinds, in the 60s, there were something like 8,000 people injured. There were hundreds of deaths and many, many thousands were incarcerated. So this, this, it's this summer of discontent, the summer of rioting in the urban cities of America that is Baldwin's context. Hence his dungeon, which refers to the ghetto, uh, shook. And this is a letter to his nephew. And he said that this innocent country set you down in a ghetto, set you down in a ghetto, in which in fact it intended you should perish. You were born into a society which spelled out with br brutal clarity and in and as many ways as possible that you were a worthless human being. You were not expected to aspire to excellence. You were expected to make peace with mediocrity. So this was at the beginning of the riots, 1962, 1962. So this was quite early on. By 1967, he uh, wrote uh, famously an essay, Negroes are anti-Semitic because they're anti-white, because they're anti-white. Now this was towards the end of the riots. Uh, there was an involvement, especially by black nationalists, who um, certainly used the rhetoric of anti-Semitism, but it was quite a popular rhetoric within these urban areas, and Baldwin addresses this in quite a complicated way. So he says the root of anti-Semitism among Negroes is ironically the re relationship of colored people all over the globe to the Christian world. This is a fact which may be difficult to grasp, not only for the ghetto's most blasted and embittered inhabitants, by that he means African-Americans, but for many Jews, to say nothing of many Christians. But it is a fact revealed by the uh, adoption on the part of colored people now of the most devastating of Christian vices. So, Baldwin here is justifying uh, the anti-Semitism, even though he says it's the most devastating of Christian vices. He was well aware of the Holocaust, certainly by 1967, uh, um, six years after the Eichmann tri trial. This was very much public knowledge. 
but he argued that uh, his his uh, fellow African Americans adopted the rhetoric, an anti Jewish rhetoric, not because. Uh, not against Jews, he would argue, but against white people, because Jews were acting exactly the same as white people. In Harlem, uh, Jews, Italians, Irish, all could leave and did leave Harlem. But uh, when it came especially to uh, Jewish Americans and Italian Americans, many of the businesses in Harlem were owned. It was called what they were owned by white people, but many of the white people were white ethnics, such as Jewish Americans and uh, um, Italian Americans. Bala Malamud has written some wonderful stories about this fact that the majority of Jews could leave, did leave uh, as part of white flight, but their businesses remained. They also remained slum landlords, some, not all, but certainly from a black point of view, they were just seen uh, as white. And Baldwin argues that it wasn't as Jews that they were abused, it was as white people. Another quote from this uh, quite contentious essay, the root of anti-Semitism um, Yeah, the uprising, sorry. So this is quote six. This is quote six, just and, uh, uh, wait, I'm, I'm sort of nudging you forward now. <laughs> okay, well, is it 10 minutes? Well, no, we've, we, no, my hand went up at 10 minutes. So, uh, so you're now sort of in the last minute. Ah, <laughs> okay, I, I missed your work. hand, I missed <laughs> your hand. So, okay, um, all right, so I'll move on very quickly. An example of uh, Martin Luther King's use of ghetto as a rhetoric, which I think is the reason why it was popularized so much in the 1960s by the black community, is quote number eight. Just right, quote number eight. He says the American Negro finds himself living in a triple ghetto, a ghetto of race, a ghetto of poverty, a ghetto of human misery. So that's in an essay that he wrote and rewrote called The Other America. The other key point I want to make in relation to Ellison and the Invisible Man is the use of invisible. So we have quote nine. Uh, this is uh, Joachim Prinz in, in Berlin in 1935 using invisible walls. This then uh, was taken up by W.E.B. Du Bois, who spent a, a lot of time in, in Germany at that time. Black people lived behind some thick sheet of invisible but horrible tangible plate. And quote 11, which I think I need to, don't know what we can do with quote 11. Yes, here it is. Quote 11. Um, being Negro in America means being herded in ghettos or reservations, being constantly ignored and made to feel invisible. Again, Martin Luther King. The invisible wall is chapter two of Kenneth Clark's Dark Ghetto, which is a, an account in 1965 after the 1964 riots in Harlem about the Harlem Ghetto. He called it the Dark Ghetto and the Invisible Wall was chapter two. And finally, uh, to finish, just to show that this is highly contentious in a way that it's not for American Jews, uh, we have a final quote what useful purpose is served by a writer like Clark, so in Dark Ghetto, an account of the Harlem Ghetto, confusing segregated housing in the, in the United States with the way Jewish life was separated from the Gentile world in the days of the old ghettos. He means the Italian ghettos. This is by a friend of Ellison's, Albert Murray, who also lived in Harlem, written in 1970, the Omni-Americans. So, um, I want to, so the point, the final point, and then I will stop uh, before I'm muted, uh, uh, literally, <laughs> is that different images of the ghetto from Nazi Germany, from Italy, from the ethnic enclaves, all were playing out in the African American ghetto as they tried to understand their plight. And that's my end point. Thank you.
Thank you so much. Uh, there's so much to respond to there, and I really hated rushing you. So if there are things you missed out, maybe during the um, uh, uh, conversation afterwards, we can go back to those things. But Absolutely. you've obviously laid out some really important themes. And But we're going to go straight on now to David, and I'll just introduce you, David, and then we can um, speak together afterwards. So... Uh, David is Professor of Contemporary Literature at the University of Reading. He is co-editor of the Edinburgh Companion of Modern Jewish Fiction and the author of four books, Post-War Jewish Fiction, Ambivalence, Self-Explanation and Transatlantic Con Connections with Palgrave, Philip Roth with Manchester University Press, Contemporary American Fiction with Edinburgh University Press and the forthcoming Howard Jacobson uh, with Man Manchester University Press. He was executive co-editor of Philip Roth Studies and has co-edited special issues of the Journal of American Studies and Jewish Culture and History. His essays have appeared in a wide range of journals, including the Yearbook of English Studies, Studies in the Novel, Modern Language Review, Canadian Literature, Studies in American Jewish Literature and Studies in Comics. Uh, this evening, David is presenting work from his new book on Howard Jacobson, and specifically tonight he's addressing Blackness and Jewishness in the fiction of Howard Jacobson. So I had over to you now, David. Thanks very much. Um, did, did, did anybody hear me? Uh, you started to freeze <laughs> it. I hope people can see and hear me okay. Can you um? Can you let me know if you can't? Yes, I realise oh, I froze. Did did people hear? Yeah. Did can people at least hear David? Okay, yeah, yeah, great. Yeah, everything I'll, I'll... is fine. Yeah, okay. Right. Okay, thanks very much um, for inviting me, Claire, and thanks very much for that introduction, Deborah. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to talk about um, blackness in how Jacobson's fiction primarily, um, and I'm going to try to trace some of the sort of ambivalent uses that he makes of blackness and the kind of connections that he makes between Jewishness and blackness. Um, and I'm going to um, try and share my screen now, which I hope will will work. Um, so, uh, see if we can get it up. Uh, can you all see that? Yeah. I hope you can. Okay. So, um, yeah, I thought I'd begin with um, with something that Howard Jacobson said in an interview. Um, with Spike Lee, the Black American um, film director. Um, and he said this, in our souls, we, that is Jews, thirst for something like approval, something at least like recognition from black people. Um, we're in the exile business together. I'm just gonna, sorry, start my stopwatch slightly belatedly. Um, so yeah, uh, I just want to kind of point out the, the kind of the, the odd um, movement of register here. He starts off with something very earnest, um, talking about souls and thirsting. Um, and then in very kind of characteristic Jacobson style, he kind of, he starts to qualify things almost immediately. Something at least like recognition, um, something like approval. So some caveats start to appear. And then of course he finishes very characteristically with a kind of joke. Um, we're in the exile business together as though, um, yeah, um, kind of so that, that the kind of dias the diasporic connections there are kind of being alluded to, but at the same time, there seems to be a kind of self-consciousness to the way that Jacobson's doing it as though aware that there might be something problematic about making those connections. Um, and it's really, it's that kind of dual movement, that kind of desire to make the connection, um, to stress kind of affinities between Jewishness and Blackness on the one hand, and at the same time, an awareness of the, the problems of doing that. It's that kind of dual duality, if you like, that ambivalence that I want to trace um, through, through Jacobson's work. Um, so um, one of the things that Jacobson does, which I think is very interesting, um, is, is he, he, sh he demonstrates an awareness, um, an acute awareness of the problem of um, Jewish anti-Black racism. So the flip side of what Baldwin was saying, um, his awareness of Black anti-Semitism. This is, this is from um, Jacobson's novel published in 2002, Who's Sorry Now? Um, he, the father of the novel's protagonist, told the punters, so he's, a, he's a, um, like Jacobson's own father was in fact, 
um, the father of Marvin Kreitman, the protagonist of Who's Sorry Now, is a market trader. Uh, and this is the protagonist recalling how he used to um, behave um, in that environment. He told the punters not to finger his leather goods if they weren't buying. Take it or fucking leave it. Sambo. Yes, Sambo as well, under his poisoned breath. Anybody called Bruno Kreitman, that's the father, a kike, and he'd have had the Haganah in and instigated another Nuremberg. But Sambo awakened no consciousness of equivalence in him. So I think what's really interesting is, is that that final line, Sambo, the, the, the use of that um, pejorative term by Kreitman, Jacob, Jacobson's um, narrator says that Kreitman had no self-consciousness about using the term. He didn't, he didn't make the connection between anti-Semitism and anti-Black racism. Um, but the implication is that there is an equivalence, that one ought to be, as a Jew, conscious of some kind of equivalence. Um, and that, that notion of equivalence is itself equivocal. I think in Jacobson. So I'm going to just try and trace trace some of that. Um, uh, so moving on to quotation number three, I'm very aware of time and I've got quite a lot of quotations. So I'm going to try and get through them all. We'll see how we go. So um, this is from Jacobson's first novel, Coming From Behind. So I'm going to be moving about kind of, um, um, uh, I'm not going to be sticking to chronology here. I'm going to move about between the novels in order to try and kind of um, uh, trace the different ways in which Jacobson invokes blackness in his fiction. Um, so, so that kind of equivalence, that, uh, that notion of equivalence is there right from the start, actually. It's there in his first novel, Coming From Behind, published in 1983, in which at one point, the, um, the very self-consciously Jewish protagonist, Sefton Goldberg, um, reflecting on his own kind of awkward status at, a, at a, an event in Cambridge, at Cambridge University, He's, he says that he felt like a token Jew performing the same function as the obligatory black policeman in American movies. I think that's a really interesting kind of connection to make. Um, so, so Jacobson sort of interested right from the start in those connections, in a kind of equivalence, or at least, at the very least, a kind of affinity. Um, but it's not that straightforward because at other times he mobilizes an idea of blackness as a kind of contrast to Jewishness. So this next quotation, number four on this um, sheet that I hope you all can see, this is from an essay that Jacobson published in 2013 called Nelly, I am Catherine Earnshaw. And in this essay, what Jacobson is doing is responding to, at that time, the newly, the newly appointed um, children's laureate, Mallory Blackman, who of course is a black British writer. And um, Blackman had just made a statement about what she'd said was um, that when she was at school, she felt invisible. So we're back to that word that Brian used. It, she felt invisible. Um, in the literature that she studied, by which she meant there were no black people in the literary canon. And Jacobson takes exception to this, um, and he reflects on his own experiences as a Jewish Northern and working class kid studying literature, English literature. And what he says is true, we weren't black, but we were Jewish Northern and working class. So if there was an invisibility to feel, we were well placed to feel it. We, in other words, he and his Jewish peers didn't read to self-identify, but in order to understand what those who were not ourselves were like, in order to meet the challenge of difference. So what Jason is doing here is, is kind of saying, invoking the comparison, but, but in order to reject it in a way. He's saying, he's saying you know, um, we have the same problem potentially as um, Mallory Blackman had. Um, we didn't see any kind of Jewish heroes. He goes on to say, you know, there were Jewish characters that we encountered in fiction, but when, but when we encountered them, we wished we hadn't, you know, so Fagin is the example that he uses. Um, 
But he says that, that, that reading, and this is part of a much larger kind of um, thread that runs through Jacobson's nonfiction. Um, he, he has a real problem with this idea of, which I think he sees as a kind of trendy, um, uh, liberal kind of idea um, of diversity, um, the need to kind of diversify the curriculum. The, the, the premise underlying that impulse to diversify the curriculum is what Jacobson takes issue with. The idea that actually you can only um, appreciate literature if you can recognize yourself in it. And he's saying, no, the point of reading literature, the point of studying literature is not to recognize yourself. It's not to look in a mirror. It's to meet what he calls the challenge of difference. Um, I mean, that, this is obviously, a, this is a problematic idea, but, but I'm just kind of laying out what Jacobson thinks. So um, um, yeah. Okay, um, so quotation number five, another kind of aspect to this kind of, problem that Jacobson has. And Jacobson is, is, you know, among other things, he is a kind of um, polemicist. Um, he's never afraid to be confrontational or controversial. Um, and one of the, so one of the problems he has in his nonfiction, but here he deals with it in his fiction as well, is, is the kind of the, the, the trendiness of um, uh, post-colonial studies, post-modernism, a whole, a whole load of kind of, of, of the, the main, most of the prevailing trends in the academy that we've seen over the last 30 or 40 years. So this is a kind of bit of satirical comedy which kind of takes aim at that. So um, this is referring to um, Marvin Kreitman's wife. We've, we've seen that earlier passage dealing with his father. This is his wife, Hazel. Had she, Hazel, pursued her own academic interest, followed up her work on the noble savage with a full-blown study of the unseen Negro, the Negro implicit or concealed, actual or mythic in English life and letters in the 18th and 19th centuries, she'd have been where the university was at. Slightly awkward formulation there, I think betraying perhaps the kind of awkwardness maybe that Jacobson feels about making this point. This passage seems to me very awkward, um, not least in the, the archaic usages of the word Negro, which he must have been aware of, already archaic in 2002, I, I, would, I would emphasize. Um, so I think he's, yeah, he's kind of, there's a tension here, I think, um, between what Jacobson kind of consciously wants to do, which is to sort of poke fun at this idea that, you know, universities are, are too um, slavishly following um, trends, um, but at the same time, yeah, I detect this kind of uneasiness in the prose here, um, a kind of, a. Uh, uh, a residual sense that maybe this is not the right fight to be engaging in. Just you've got uh, ten minutes. You, you've done. Okay, thank you. I think I'm. I think I'm on track. <laughs> I hope so. Um. So number quotation number six. Max's England is a place. Sorry, this is this is from a very critical review of another of Jacobs's novels, Kaluki Nights. Um. Max's England is a place where Jews are the only racial and ethnic minority, and nearly everyone else is a golden-haired Saxon. This is um, a, a, a newspaper reviewer, Marcus Roth, kind of laying into Jacobson. So I think in the time that I've got left, I want to kind of to think about um, how this works and to think about, um, well, to think about the extent to which this is and isn't true. So, so it is true that there aren't many black characters in Jacobson and those that there are, are um, mostly marginal, mostly fairly ephemeral characters. But the idea of blackness, what we might call the black imaginary, blackness as a symbolic thing, a symbolic, symbolic idea is actually really important in Jacobson. So quotation number seven, um, again, based on affinity, um, coming from behind again, back to the first novel, sure you discovered then how badly served the English have been, wang wise, why else are they so uncomfortable with black men and Jews? So, it's particularly in the sexual sphere that this kind of um, this idea of blackness is invoked by Jacobson in his fiction. And here again, it's on the basis of comparison. Both Jews and black men um, make English men uneasy. A similar kind of thing going on in quotation number eight. This is from his second novel, Peeping Tom, published in 1984. Um, and the Jewish protagonist of that novel, Barney Fugelman, has this 
childhood crush, kind of adolescent crush on his next door neighbor, Rabika Flatman. And he says of her, she was one of those Jewish women who just miss out on looking African. She had broad nostrils and fleshy lips and an easy swaying nonchalance of gait. But no matter how much time she put in lying in the sun, she lacked the finishing touch of color. She was swarthy, but she wasn't black. I didn't mind. The rippling mockery of her laughter was still sufficient to cause the white men's wives to lie awake and worry under their mosquito nets. So, um, I mean, this obviously flirts again dangerously, I think problematically certainly with black stereotypes. But what I'm really interested in here is the way that Jacobson um, actually implies that Jews are not white. They're not, as, as uh, Brian was talking about, white ethnics. For Jacobson, they're not. They are actually to be associated with blacks as non-white, as people who will make white people worry and particularly worry about their own sexuality. They will be threatening to white sexuality. Okay, but this works in, in different and complex ways. So quotation number nine, um, from another of Jacobson's novels, No More Mr. Nice Guy. Um, I'm just going to see, how am I doing for time? Um, I've got, according to my stopwatch. Like a, a minute and a half or something. Okay, two minutes. Okay, so <laughs> I won't read all of this out. I'll let, you, I'll let you read it for yourselves. I hope you can do that while I'm talking to you. And what I'll just point out is the kind of the ambivalence towards the idea of black sexuality that is manifested in, in this passage. So the, the protagonist here expresses um, uh, a kind of envy of this person, um, this Spaniard or Turk or something, an, an interestingly ethnically um, undefined person whom he recalls as having um, a desirable black partner um, and they were always having sex. That's how he remembers it. And he remembers this, um, he, he, the whole way that he talks about this is kind of, well, it's racist uh, to, to, to put it um, uh, as plainly as possible. And you might think, and you might argue that Jacobson's complicit with Frank Rich's racism, but there's a, there's a complication here. I think in a sense, the joke here is on Frank because um, when he says to his friend, his friend says she didn't object to this, the black woman being treated in this sexualized way. Of course she didn't object to it. That's how they do it over there, Frank says. And his friend says in Morecambe, and Frank says in Africa schmuck. But actually he's the schmuck because the in Morecambe comment reveals, it exposes Frank's racism really. Um, this is also true of my penultimate quotation. Again, I won't read it all, I'll just kind of um, hope that you can read it, this quotation number 10, which is again from the same novel, No More Mr. Nice Guy. And again, it invokes this racist stereotype of a Jamaican born musician and drug dealer um, who's been apparently um, beating up um, the, uh, another sexual partner of Frank's. Um, and, and yeah, all of that is kind of problematic. But again, right at the end, the joke is kind of turned on Frank, because when he, when his girlfriend says, um, Frank says, has he been hitting you while you've been seeing me? And she says, not all the time. And anyway, you, you meaning Frank, don't hit me. The narrator says, ref, says, was that an accusation? Did Frank have his shortcomings as a lover? Shortcomings being, of course, a, a rather um, a, an obvious Jacobsonian pun, shortcomings. Um, so the idea is here, Frank is himself threatened by the sexual prowess of the black man. The black man, it's a stereotype, yes, but, but it, his own racism, I think, is being exposed here. Um, the final quotation returns us to this idea of um, uh, the kind of, the, the way in which sexualized images of black people find their way into popular culture. So again, I won't read it out, but I, I just wanted to finish with this kind of, um, this quotation, because I think it, it, again, it, it demonstrates that awareness on Jacobson's part of, of his own problematic use of blackness, but also his desire to kind of, um, at the same time, um, satirize 
the the kind of larger cultural problem which he's kind of which he which he wants to diagnose i think um so i think i'll leave it there i hope you were able to read those quotations um and i'll stop thanks thank you so much david um can we uh return to the maybe if we take the um so that we can see both you and brian now um yeah i'll stop maybe, sharing <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, but I think that I can see from the chat people are really wanting to uh, get a hold of those quotations. So I think we're, we're going to make them available to everybody somehow and they'll be able to um, hopefully download them from home because this is, uh, Brian, can you can you sort of appear again uh, to, to us so that we can, yeah, hi. Um, uh, because uh, now we're going to, you know, have you talk to each other and Maybe I, I'm going to talk, <laughs> and uh, because these uh, these papers to me really do talk to each other, and and I mean not just this sort of idea of invisibility and a sort of sort of strange, almost paradoxical competition over who's the most invisible, <laughs> and <laughs> and who who really gets to lay claim to having no identity that uh, 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 that exists, but but this sort of very moving idea that you're introduced with uh, Howard Jacobson talking to Spike Lee and saying. I want your recognition. <laughs> so there was a, this sort of desire for the politics of recognition, and 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 what kind of recognition you're asking for. And we have this uh, um, complicated thing where we're situating the Jew here on the one hand, uh, wanting to be recognised as black, and on the other hand, wanting to be recognised as white. And different groups are 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 positioned in different ways. And and then of course there's the politics of who is. The real victim of the ghetto, who's the real victim of persecution, and 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 so on. So, so these sort of range of recognitions that are floating uh, around are are, are are strange. But it, I suppose it's particularly confusing when we set up this opposition, Jews and Blacks, because there are, of course, Black people who are Jewish, Jewish people who are Black. And where is that? Yes. Where I mean, what what is? Do we do you have? Or even more invisible. Like, but who are the most invisible, right? invisible. Because, yeah. because there's an implicit assumption they they can't dwell in the same body uh, do, do you have any sense of where that narrative fits into this both of you um i i i think it depends what where and what time and what period you're you're looking at i think if you for instance go to the caribbean and uh someone like carol phillips Andrea Levy, they both claim uh, Jewish antecedents and they both write um, about uh, Jewish history in, in, in different ways. Uh, and, and I think the Caribbean is very much a place where, uh, with, with a culture of creolization. So blacks and Jews are very much mixed and, and, and mixed up. And of course, there were, uh, a number, uh, Harlem did have a, a quite a large number of um, uh, blacks from the Caribbean, um, but I think I think um, we're we're kind of dealing with two different things. I mean, a lot of what David said was about, as he said, the black imaginary, and um, I think the uh, we had a kind of social space which I was talking about, which also included the black imaginary and the Jewish imaginary, but also an actual social space mm -hmm. as well. So there is a kind of difference there that, that I think Jacobson is dealing with um, very much the imaginary and the idea of an equivalence be in relation to sexuality, for instance, you'll find, I mean, you need, all you need to do is go back to Svengali and books written around that time and before that time for, for the idea of the hypersexualized Jew, it, it's all there. Mm -hmm. The point that I was making is that, that Jews uh, became, were allowed to become white in America. Mm -hmm. um, and so those kinds of stereotypes fell off. Mm -hmm. uh, if you'll excuse the expression. <laughs> 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 yes, yes, I, I think I, I think that I think that's absolutely right. I, I mean, Jacobson, um, like a lot of um, British Jewish writers, and for that matter, like a lot of British black writers, um, I think is always has one eye 
over the Atlantic, one one eye over the you know, kind of casting one eye over the pond. Um, uh, and so I wanted to start with that kind of Spike Lee interview to kind of frame it in that way. Um, because I think, and the, the reason that they do, of course, is because the 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 issues that um, that we're talking about are heightened by the very different history that we're talking about. If we're talking about the history of the ghetto, or we're, we're talking about the history of, of, of slavery, obviously, um, and so on um, uh, in America. So you know that the whole kind of question of the relation ship the relationship between blacks and jews it, it is kind of um the 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 american context is where that becomes kind of very heightened very dramatized um and and so jacobson kind of yeah i think he 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 always has one eye on that um and on his jewish american novelist kind of precursors slash peers when he's writing about these issues but at the same time, he wants to hang on to this. There is also a kind of British context and that context is to do with, I think for Jacobson, it's to do with two things. It's to do with what's going on in the academy or what he perceived as going on in the academy, which, which maybe are two different things, I think. Um, uh, and and it, it's to do with that and it's to do with, um, it's to do with Jacobson's perception, which again, one might say is, is partly a convenient misperception, but I think Jacobson wants, wants to feel, certainly wanted to feel earlier on in his career that Jews and blacks in this country did, did share a kind of a, a, um, a, a problem in terms of being marginalized and stigmatized and, and suffering prejudice, but also, I mean, he wanted to turn, turn that on its head, as I think you saw from those quotations that I was using, to kind of to, 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 to think about the, the ways in which, in which um, both Blacks and Jews um, posed a kind of threat to, to the kind of the white establishment, if you like, or the way that white, white British people think about themselves. Um, and there are all sorts of reasons why he might have wanted to do that. But I think, I mean, we can, and obviously we can see, and I think he himself could see problems with that, but, but yeah. Um. Hmm. Yes. Um, I, I like very much what Tavora said about the, the Jews having competing kinds of recognitions. Um, and certainly there's a whole history of Jews uh, very much identifying uh, with blackness, um, uh, uh, you can place Bob Dylan at the heart of that history, and then go back from Bob Dylan and forward. Um, so, I, I and what Jacobson does show is that, and, and this is obviously important, that Jews are not quite white. So, I think yeah, when it comes, to he really he really wants to hold on to that. And as I yeah. said, you can you can kind of see. You can see the problems with that and the limitations of that, and you can see I think Jacobson's struggling with that. So on the one hand, he's kind of saying, you know, we 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 you know he's wanting to make that connection. At the same time, I think he knows that that actually Jews are not not white in the same way as blacks are not white. Yes, and that oh. we're talking about you know interesting kind of nuances here, but but there's a there's a joke that the uh comedian Sarah Silverman uh, tells she says people are always introducing me as Sarah Silverman the Jewish comedian and I hate that I wish people would see me for who I really am I'm white and I think the joke works because because the laughter hinges on the fact that she isn't uh, uh, that she isn't white and nobody really believes uh, she ever entirely could be so the whole notion of passing uh, lingers around there that she's white until she claims she's white. Uh, uh, and, 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 and so, so we're in this strange arena where, of course, Jews have identified with blacks. And most recently we have this example of Jessica Krug, who, uh, who's literally doing the opposite thing, passing uh, mm. as, as black. And we can speculate I mean, about mm. cultural appropriation and all these strange, strange motives that have lingered there, but it is an example 
I think of somebody who for whatever the psychopathology, there's a kind of desire to make, to speak in that voice as if uh, for certain, uh, for certain uh, Jewish people, it's very hard for them to work out what kind of identification they should have. And they're thinking constantly in these racial terms. Is that, I mean, is that the problem here? That we're setting things up against each other that, that shouldn't be set up against each other because actually they're unalike. They're different categories of identity and experience in a way, although they have shared persecutions in their history. Do, do, do you see the question? Certainly when it comes to the American ghetto, it's, un it's unalike. Um, but then if you move to Europe, of course, it's unalike in a different, in a different way. Um, but I think, I think it is, what I think is important, and especially now with so much focus on the question of white uh, privilege, white superiority, whiteness in general, in relation to, say, decolonizing the curriculum, I think it is actually important for groups like Jews, also Irish, Italian, other what I call what are called in America, and I think I'm happy to go with it, calling them white ethnics, um, because um, you, I, I use the example, you know, with a guy saying to me, "I'm the whitest guy he's ever seen." Um, well, I don't feel white. I mean, to, to quote your book. So um, feeling Jewish and feeling white is not the same. Um, and, and David showed wonderfully how, how Jacobson um, moves from equivalence, affinity to difference. And we move, and I think Jews constantly move in and out. But, th but that very disruptive nature of Jewish whiteness, I think is actually quite important to complicate the whole decolonizing the curriculum movement um, and, and to actually problematize whiteness um, and not just take it as a kind of homogenous global fact, which quite often it is. Yeah, I would agree completely with that. Can I just pause to deal with a couple of questions that I, or issues that I've seen cropping up in the chat? Um, so um, Rachel asked, what was Spike Lee's response to Jacobson's comment in the quote? Well, interestingly, if, I, if I'm rem remembering correctly, this is only from memory, he doesn't put it directly to Spike Lee, he frames the interview with that. So that bit is aimed at the reader, which is quite interesting, I think. Um, and I wanted to, to, cause I think it's an important issue. Um, Merritt um, says saying blacks is problematic. No one has referred to white people as whites. So it would be fair to call black people, black people. Um, well, Merritt, we have been talking about Jews. We could be saying Jewish people. Um, uh, so um, I think nomenclature is always problematic. Um, I mean, Brian in his talk, was sometimes saying black, sometimes saying African-American. Mm -hmm. Howard Jacobson, you, I drew, drew attention to the fact that he was using Negro, which used to be, used to be when Baldwin and Ellison were writing in the 50s and 60s, that was the polite term. That was the correct term, actually, but it wasn't anymore by the time Jacobson was using it in the 1990s. So, so while I think we can all acknowledge, yeah, these issues are, are difficult and I wouldn't claim that anyone has the solution to them. Um, I think it's also only fair to us to point out that, that we've been saying Jews as well as blacks. So, um, so if there's a problem with one, there's a problem with both. Um, it, I hope it, ha I mean, if it's caused offense to anyone, I, I would apologize, but certainly none is meant. Um, the final question I'm, I'm afraid I don't understand about, um, I'm curious what you think the reason for the rise of the black Hebrew Israelites is, um, especially in this context. Um, are, are you talking about e Ethiopian? No, the, well, the Black Hebrews Carol Phillips writes about. Oh, okay. Um, and that, that actually is a counter example to Jewish identification with African Americans, with black people. Uh, that's very much uh, uh, um, black people identifying with, with Jew, Jewish history and with lost tribes. And um, they ended up in Israel, uh, a lot of the black Hebrews. So, and yeah, Carol, I mean, and, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that was something that Carol Phillips has written about at, at length. Yeah, um, yeah. So there are all of these um, uh, plural identifications, disidentifications, recognitions, lack of recognition, um, as, I, as I said, the word ghetto, which was totally, completely ubiquitous, 
in the 60s and 70s and 80s now is quite often seen as a term of abuse. The New York Public Library uh, ha has uh, made it taboo, for instance. And, uh, and if anyone other than African-Americans use the term ghetto, that is seen to be an insult today. So yeah. all of these words have a kind of politics around them and a history around Absolutely, them. Absolutely, yeah. They, they, they are, they're, they're always, uh, they always come with political baggage and that, and that their, the particular currency, the particular charge that they have at any given moment, I mean, it, it does vary radically from, from context to context, period to period, um, country to country and so on. So, so yeah, I just want to go back to what you were saying earlier, Brian, about kind of, you know, Jewishness being kind of a, way, a useful way of kind of disrupting, um, you know, the sort of black, white dichotomy, which I think it is. Um, uh, and I suppose that was one of the points I was trying to make. I think that, that's one of the things that Jacobson is trying to, to, to do with it. Um, but at the same time, of course, we have to recognize, and, and I would absolutely echo what you said about not feeling white. So when I have to fill in those equal opportunities forms, I'm always in this sort of quandary because there doesn't seem to be a place for me. There's not, none of the boxes that you can tick accurately describes what I feel about myself, which is, and this is where the problem comes, which is that yes, I have the privilege to claim whiteness, at least in certain contexts. But at the same time, I'm keenly aware that for a lot of people, I will never be white. And you only have to look at the rhetoric of the white supremacists whom Donald Trump resolutely refuses, let us remind ourselves to disown or even distance himself from. You only need to look at their rhetoric to see how non-white, how, how um, insistently, non-white Jews remain in the eyes of white supremacists and white racists. And I would just say on that point, I mean, it's really interesting. I started off with Spike Lee. I mean, Spike Lee's, uh, not his most recent film, but the one before that, Black Klansman, ends with footage of white supremacists in the Trump era chanting, Jews will not replace us. Hmm. Um, and what, what I think many viewers of that film might not have realized is, is what they mean by that. So in their, in their twisted conspiracy theory worldview, Jews will not replace us. That does not mean that they think Jews will replace them, the white supremacists. It means that they think there's a Jewish conspiracy to replace whites with blacks. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, this is really kind of, or with the impure deeply racism. Murky, yeah. Deeply murky stuff, mm. um, but, um, but, but really revealing, I think, if, we, if we're thinking about when is a Jew white and when, when, does it, when is a Jew not white. Um, yeah. Uh, you yeah. Know. I think we're gonna, um, uh, I, I have a whole list of questions that I'm, I, don't, I, I can't use my privilege to ask because there, there's all kinds of privilege, including chairs privilege. But I've announced mine, and uh, and we'll move to the um, uh, to the questions that are forming in the chat. And I would recommend uh, anybody else adds their questions or raises their hands. I can see somebody's also raised their hands, and they can ask by turning off their uh, they're turning on their mic. But we'll start. There's some questions in. Uh, the, I think you dealt with some of these. Uh, has Jacobson changed his views since uh, Roots Schmutz? Yes. And actually, I was sort of hoping this would come up. It's very interesting because um, that word equivalence, which I was kind of highlighting as a very interesting and problematic term that Jacobson uses in the context of, of making that connection um, between Jewish people and black people, as I think I'm now going to try to start calling them. Um, he uses exactly the same term in Root Schmutz to describe the failure of empathy that he encounters among some Israeli Jews towards the Palestinians. And what he says there is that's the word he uses, I mean, I'm going to paraphrase, but he uses the word equivalence, I remember that quite clearly, and he says something like, he, he expresses shock and dismay at the failure to recognise equivalence. And what's really interesting about that is if you know, if you follow Jacobson's career in any way, if you know, if you know um, anything about Jacobson's more recent interventions in 
um, the whole Israel-Palestine kind of debate, then you will know that he has become known for being a kind of, um, well, actually, I was going to say staunch defender of Israel. That's not true. That's not fair. He's consistently, he's consistently condemned Netanyahu and the illegal settlement and so on. But what he's also condemned is what he sees as um, unfair um, and indeed anti-Semitically motivated, disproportionate criticism of Israel. And in particular, what he's condemned is anti-Israel rhetoric that strays into making comparisons between Israeli oppression of the Palestinians and Nazi oppression of the Jews. Um, so I think, um, I don't know whether that was the question really, but, 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 but it, it's something that, that I find really interesting. I mean, that he, certainly, yes, I mean, in that way and in other ways, I think his views have shifted. Um, um, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, that, I know the whole Israel-Palestine thing is another kind of huge topic and perhaps, yeah. perhaps it's something we, we should be wary of getting involved in, but I think it is relevant here. It's relevant here. Um, I think it was, it was there in Jacobson's mind when he was talking to Spike Lee, because as Rachel points out in, again, in the chat, she said Black Klansman was quite a shift for Lee. I think what you probably have in mind, Rachel, is that earlier on in Spike Lee's career, he was... Um, he seemed to be much more kind of open to uh, the kind of accusations of Jewish complicity with the history of racism and the whole, whole kind of Louis Farrakhan kind of um, uh, kind of yeah um, version of um, uh, what we might call black anti-Semitism. We've got a question from Tony to all panellists. Uh, Brian, uh, uh, James Baldwin seems to be rightly rediscovered. How does his construction of the ghetto go alongside the, the avoidance of that term more recently? Um, uh, th thanks. Um, an interesting question. Uh, I think Baldwin's been rediscovered because of the Black Lives Matter movement, because of his, his writing on, on the riots. And he... Uh, was a very important person who articulated the nature of black rage and black anger in America during the, the riots, the summer of, of uh, the 1960s riots. Um, today, it's, it's interesting. I um, have spoken in America um, on the African-American ghetto. And I actually asked, um, Cornel West was there in the audience, whether ghetto was a useful term uh, still today. Today, And this was just a, a year or two back. And he first of all talked about the hood, but then he said, yes. Um, I think uh, Cornel West uh, no, uh, has obviously read all of these figures, knows the history of the use of the term ghetto and thought that it, that it was useful. And there are plenty of people uh, who are campaigning very much in the spirit of the Black Lives Matter movement for social justice and, and talk about the ghetto in, in those terms. So um, I think like, all of the, like a lot of this field and, 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 and a lot of uh, once you get into questions of race, and especially, and I have to say, when it's men talking about it, and virtually everyone uh, that we're talking about is a man, so there's a kind of masculinity there's a, which leads to polemicism. Um, um, but uh, there is all of these terms are contested, but that doesn't mean that, 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 that the ghetto isn't used, and especially in the name of social justice. Mm -hmm. That 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 um recent recent or well, fairly recently released documentary I'm I am not your Negro um, on Baldwin I think has also kind of well it's both it's both evidence of his kind of rediscovery or rehabilitation if you like um, his relevance now but also it's helped in turn to kind of reinforce that I think and if uh, if anyone who, anyone who hasn't seen it it's a brilliant a brilliant film I would really recommend it and I think it's a I think it's it might be on iPlayer at the moment I think it might be available but. Um, anyway, yeah. Yeah. Well, for me, Brian, he's not so far off, Alison uh, Baldwin. I, I can hear my children having a bath next door. I'm really sorry. Uh, <laughs> ah. <laughs> um, uh, um, uh, the, 
he's not so far off. I, I mean, I feel there's a lot of misreadings of Baldwin going on right now. Do you not? Do, do you have that sense that he's being positivized in a? a he's, I feel he's being turned into an, in, in, into a more simple kind of idea of. Or what? What is your view? Uh, yes, I, I think that's. I'm sure that's true. Um, mm -hmm. Just once you become a kind of iconic figure, then everything becomes simplified. The same happened to Primo Levi as well. He, 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 um, uh, um, Baldwin and Ellison, it was all about dialogue, really. It, um, and I think they were both, and this, this is four years before Ellison wrote uh, the novel. So he was still thinking through exactly what kind of novel he would write and he wrote a completely unique work so he was working he, um so i think the dialogue helped him to understand what his approach would be to the harlem ghetto as baldwin called it he didn't want to reduce it to a ghetto but a lot of what they were talking about of course they both lived there um i think baldwin was living there at the time until he, until he, he eventually moved to france um, uh, they they both knew there was a very concrete social context for, for what they were both talking about. Absolutely. And they, and they both, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, brother, I, I, I think they, they both critiqued Richard Wright, actually. Absolutely. In, in yeah. similar terms, which Absolutely. is quite interesting. So in that sense, and they certainly shared a kind of a sense of what they felt were the kind of limitations of the kind of fiction that he was writing. Um, yeah. And I think they, they both wanted to get away from that. Um, absolutely. It, it in different ways. No, absolutely. They certainly had that, that in common. And uh, we, we have in one time or another taught, taught Percival Everett's wonderful novel, Erasure, which is, uh, continues that critique of Richard Wright, I think. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I thought I was going to get to do a good question then, but there's another one shown up. So <laughs> it's my duty to turn over to the chat. And it says, Brian, could you say something about class, how class intersects with questions of the ghetto in the US? Does it complicate the idea of ethnic whites? And David, how does class work within Jacobson's thinking? I was struck with his inclusion of it as a factor in his appudiation of Mallory Blackman. It's true, big questions, really important ones. Well, Clara, no, I'm really glad that, that you've asked that question because um, I mean, and that's one of the real problems about just talking about race. Uh, even uh, it's been a factor around COVID, for instance, the, the link between uh, num numbers of uh, um, ethnic minorities, BAME, the group, the BAME group, if you like, uh, having a higher uh, incidence of COVID and the same in America with Hispanics and African-Americans. But of course, class, if we take class out of that equation, we really don't understand anything. And um, one, what happened after the riots was that the, um, the, the federal and state authorities, but coming very much from the federal authorities, uh, created a... Uh, um, a black middle class, and, and it was a form of social engineering that jobs in prisons, in the lo local social wel welfare forms, um, the uh, uh, housing associations were outlawed so that the black middle classes could move out of the urban areas and did, and had jobs to go to. And from the 70s onwards, there was a, a, a creation of a black middle class in America. And what that resulted in by the 1980s was that, that in the centers of Washington, uh, Chicago, um, parts of New York, not quite the centers, but parts of New York, uh, in all of these northern cities, you had areas which were called by the 1980s, you had a black underclass. Mm -hmm. So the black middle class did leave and it was all about class. Uh, the ghetto areas, then in the northern cities were very much about what was called by um, black people and African-American academics, what was called a black underclass. And uh, class became the key factor for, and to this day from the 1980s onwards.
Yeah. Um, yes, um, I mean, we're all intersectionalists now. So, of course, class, class <laughs> is important in Jacobson's thinking, um, particularly in Jacobson's thinking, because his own, his own um, upbringing, he, um, you know, he, 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 he talks a lot, he's talked a lot about this in his nonfiction, in, in interview after interview, you know, the fact that he grew up in, 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 a, in a house without books, really. Um, and yeah, um, he, 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 um, he, Felt like a fish out of water at Cambridge, where he was taught by F.R. Leavis. He admired Leavis a lot, but at the same time, he always felt marginalised. He felt excluded from that kind of um, academic establishment. Um, but of course, so, so class is important in Jacobson and for Jacobson. At the same time, again, you know, we need to kind of remember that Jacobson was able to make that transition from working class working class Jewish, not ghetto, but maybe enclave, it was a kind of, you know, a, a very much a Jewish area that he grew up in, in Manchester to, um, to becoming, you know, as he is now, I mean, he is kind of a, he's a public intellectual, as well as a, as well as a, a man book award winning novelist, he's very much part of the establishment. Um, so he was able to make that transition in a way that I would argue his black contemporaries would have found much more problematic because in the end, for all the fact that, you know, we've been emphasizing, like, I think it's, you know, it, it, is, it is important to say that Jews are only allowed to claim whiteness in certain contexts. Um, but at the same time, Jews don't have that kind of absolute barrier um, more often than not in terms of passing. Do you, passing is, accessible to more Jews, shall we put it that way, to more Jewish people than it is to black people. Um, uh, a lot of black people simply don't have the option of passing. They cannot claim that privilege. And, and that, so class is important, but, but in the end, if you are, you know, if you are a, a young black man in America, for example, then I don't think class is going to protect you from a policeman's bullet at the end of the day. If you find yourself in the wrong place at the wrong time, you are in danger, you know, and, and one cannot say the same of Jews, um, I don't think. So, so I think we need, to, we need to keep that in mind as well. Yeah, it's, it's I mean, uh, as Rachel just pointed, of course, Jews aren't the only ones who pass. I mean, if they can, if if they, I mean, we have Nella Larson. There's of course Absolutely. Philip Roth's common silk passing as Jewish in order to, but 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 the but the um, uh, but it also it seems again it's we have to be careful about comparing these histories because then if blackness is a sort of persecution of a difference that seems so sort of obvious that that that, 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 that there's a difference there then you can have a kind of persecutions that based on the lack of obviousness. Uh, the, so the anti-Semitism would be related to the fact that these people can pass, which then for periods of history means they do very well. And then suddenly there's periods where that becomes the reason that there's tremendous danger to that particular group. So all these comparisons seem to me to be, um, so we have to be so careful about them, but they're so, always so tempting because they're sort of laid out in this politics of recognition. But I suppose one thing that, um, uh, comes back to me again is when when you're seeking recognition from someone whether or not it's fantasized you're attributing a great deal of power to that person over you so when when uh when Howard Jacobson says he's that Jews seek recognition from blacks it's he's he's saying uh I I attribute tremendous cultural determining power uh to you which could be uh uh true <laughs> or could be part of the sort of phallic, I mean, this is a sort of Lacanian, sort of a phallic fantasized sort of idea of, 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 of power uh, and so on. But it, it seems to me to be always likely to erase anything meaningful and different in that, in that moment. That there seems to be a kind of comparison going on. And it, it brought to my mind a book that's rarely spoken about, a novel, I think it was 1985, Law Seagal's My First American, I don't know. Um, yeah. If you read it, it's the only novel I've really read in which, I mean, it's uh, Law Seagal's, I think it's based on her own experiences. Yeah, yeah. Uh, she's got it's a, a, a semi -biographical. sort of escaped, a refugee from Nazi Germany, and her first American, the first American she really meets, 
is a black American and an intellectual and it's a love story. And so that love story allows this relationship to be shaped not by competition uh, and not by erasing each other's differences, by a, but by a kind of mutual recognition um, that doesn't say we're the same and doesn't say we're different, finds points in common, but is really interested in, in the differences and is also really interested in the temptations in both of their own communities uh, uh, to be unsubtle. And somehow their love affair allows them not to be seduced by kind of forms of self-hatred within their own. Uh, mm. There's not enough love stories, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> well, do, you, do, you, do you have thoughts about that kind of idea of recognition of a sort of mutual? Mm. No, I like that a lot. Uh, I um, <clears throat> The opposite of that is what I call supersessionism. And I think um, what we do get a lot of is the, is the idea of uh, one history superseding another, one history completely transcending and tra transfiguring another. And uh, what mutual, what the, the opposite of that mutual recognition gives you is a, rec is, a, is a recognition of each of different histories at different times um, all of the everything we're talking about is relational. It's related to context. It's rela it's related to time. It's related to place, um, and and it's and that level of complexity we have to bring in the supersession a supersessionism which uh, is ingrained in Christian culture. You know, we have the Old Testament and we have the New Testament, and the New supersedes the Old, and the idea in general of newness superseding the old and the old somehow is in the past and we and has nothing to do with the new is very very ingrained so i what i would say is that we need as many alternatives to that form of supersessionism as we can find yeah absolutely i agree with that completely yeah i, I mean i i agree with you Deborah, that that they have that law siegel novel off, does offer a kind of model of of respectful dialogue, um, kind of respecting difference, but also finding a space for affinity, um, which is yeah, it's sort of it's, it is a neglected it's a neglected gem, I think. But yeah, I mean, I think now more than ever, we 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 have to find a space for dialogue and for nuance because these things are so conspicuously missing in most of the public discourse that we're all exposed to and kind of bombarded with you know particularly on social media um but yeah um I, I think i think we have a we have an obligation um as as academics who are interested in these issues to try to do our little bit you know modest though it might be to try to kind of um promote that that kind of dialogue and that kind of sensitivity to different histories, which, as Brian says, kind of coexist. It's it, you know, <laughs> it's it, you can't draw a line and say, right, this is this is old news. This is you know, you know, um, you know, uh, and uh, you can't. Histories do not supersede each other or eclipse each other, and nor should they be in competition with each other. So you know, the the idea that yeah, that, that there has to be kind of you know. Um, uh, some kind of hierarchy of suffering or persecution. Um, so, you know, if you're going to kind of talk about slavery, then then that has to sort of trump the Holocaust. Or if you're going to tr talk about the Holocaust, then no, that trumps slavery. You know, because that's real genocide. I mean, th th you know, th th these these kinds of of polemical positions are just, to put it mildly, incredibly unhelpful. Um, and and I think you know what we need to do is move past them. And even and just fantasize because what what form would this recognition takes where you're okay you're suddenly <laughs> my story is completely yeah. authorized everybody's onto it now I'm fine uh, and now I'm ready so it's it just it's I mean it's wrong headed from the start I'm I'm conscious um uh, um I'm I'm conscious that this oh the the AI was unable to send um, my Lord Segal my first American oh I think Claire did um um. Uh, and Tony Kushner approves of that novel too, which is, <laughs> there's all kinds of um, recommendations to that novel. I really, obviously, though, I have a hundred questions that I, I noted during your talks that I didn't get to ask, but I know this is past our sell-by date. So um, uh, uh, I will, um, 
Uh, thank you both so much for uh, really fascinating and productive talks. And hopefully this is recorded and people will be able to go back and also get hold of your handouts and uh, read your books, which are, I think, both coming out in November. Is that right? And mine's out. It's November. Oh, yours is out already. Oh, I see. Yeah. I see. I thought it was OK. OK, yeah, so it's, it's November in America. In, in America, it's November. My, mine's supposed to come out 1st November. Yeah, and I, I should add that actually everything I talked about today is not in the book. It's it's probably it's material I'll probably work up into an article, but it's it, it's on the cutting room floor, as it were. It finished up on the cutting room floor because I didn't. Yeah. Um. So so um, I suppose I just wanted to say that I don't know why did I want to say that just 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 for the record. And I suppose in case anyone wants to kind of or expects to find those quotations in the book, you won't. So if you if you want if you want to use them, then um, then, uh, you know, please acknowledge this this event because they probably won't find their way into print for a while yet. Um, yeah. I would have liked more M Martin Luther King in mind, but alas, <laughs> alas not. <laughs> and that might be an article as well, actually. <laughs>